Hello, one and all, and welcome to the podcast we call The Fantastival with myself, Stephen Nussbaum, in the podcast where I invite my guests to come on and talk to me all about their musical tastes, their memories, their experiences, and they get to create their fancy festivals, which I have christened Fantastivals. I hope everyone is well as you're listening to this. We are now in mid-June, and before we start this episode, just want to give a massive shout out to Kenny Harkis, who was my last guest in episode 167. What a lovely beautiful man one of my favorite episodes i think that i've recorded is so down to earth lovely guy great fantasy festival lineup and just almost the perfect guest i loved having him on the podcast so kenny thank you for coming on the pod it was a pleasure to host you so if anyone's listening to this and hasn't listened before please go back and check out 167 it's an absolute stormer however we go on to 168 and this week i am delighted to introduce guitarist songwriter X H and V that I've just found out. If you've listened to Lafaro or Little Matador, you'll know this gent very well. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Dave McGee. It's me. Hi. Hi, Steve. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Pleasure. Pleasure. Dave. Very, very sweet. I've heard such great things about you from mutual acquaintances. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking so forward to having you on the pod. Lots to talk about. But before we do, always like to find out how my guests are doing. Always important to talk about mental health so to start off with dave how are you mate uh yeah I'm, I'm good thanks steve yeah all the better for hanging out with you on this um mild i want to say mild evening it's a mild evening um yeah yeah i'm good i'm good um taking it fairly handy these days you know so it's become a bit less stressful over the last while which is great for the mental health yeah so c- can't complain for once i mean literally if we held this podcast tomorrow it could be a completely different thing. You know, I could be, you could have me in floods of tears, but, <laughs> but hopefully not. Uh, how are you doing, Steve? I'm all good. I'm all good. My um, oldest daughter is going away on her residential tomorrow. So she's year six. She's about to flee the nest for two nights. First time she's ever been away, or it'll be the longest amount of time she's ever been away from home. So I'm quite excited about it, but also sad. At the same time, yeah. I'm not quite sure how to feel about it, but she'll be fine. <laughs> She's more than ready. So, Dave, I found out you used to work for H and V, right? And I can't believe this. You said you almost worked for H and V for like ten years back in the day. So we've got something in common already. We do, yeah, we do. Apart from our joint desires uh, in a musical sense uh, <laughs> and outside music, well, we'll talk about those in the other podcast <laughs> that's unlisted on Spotify. Yeah, yeah, both both H and Vers. And I know I just I, I noticed that you. Yeah, you had it, and I think it was your maybe your Twitter profile mm. that you mentioned that. And uh, yeah, I have such fond memories, Steve, of working for HMV back in the day. And I started in, um, like yourself, started as a Christmas temp in where did I start? Forestside in Belfast, which is like there's a shopping centre there. And uh, my manager at the time was actually uh, Rick from Ash, who you've had on your on your podcast. One of my favourite people in the world. He's an old pal of mine, Rick. Um, it was his brother Dave. Was the manager uh, also a lovely man? So yeah, I started there, and uh, who did I start? I'm trying to think of who I started with. So it was me. I think my brother started at the same time as well, and he was in Lafaro with me, and my my one of my oldest pals, Ian, who was in the band with for ages, he was there, and then Nathan, who uh, I played with for years, who was in Snow Patrol and and all that caper, and we'll, I'm sure he'll come up again later on, and then Little Little Matador with me as well. He was he worked there as well. Oh, uh, wow. So those were wild times, Steve. <laughs> um, wild, wild time. I mean, we were like 22 or something, you know. And but it's uh, I, yeah, I have fond memories, and yeah, HMV holds a, a big big place in my part in my in my. Uh, that part of my life, you know, uh, has a yeah, I have very fond memories of it. I'll but yeah, I worked there, and then, and then uh, yeah, I worked in the big the big store in Belfast, the big kind of the big fancy one, which has, it has an escalator and everything. Steve, I'll tell you what, <laughs> no expense spared. So yeah, good times. So I'm glad you're still with with HMV and you know fighting the good fight. Absolutely, man and boy. That escalator that you mentioned in Belfast blew up on TikTok. <laughs> by the way, about six months ago, they oh t- really? They done a massive TikTok got millions of views it was i don't really understand tiktok it was a bit of a you know where does this escalator lead that goes to the top and uh it done very well so that escalator will outlift the both of us i think once we're long on that escalator will outlive wow everyone that's that's incredible that's that's on i'm amazed it's still going the amount of times it used to <laughs> break down when i worked there but wow that's that's great 
Well done, Escalator. Absolutely. This well, we'll dedicate this podcast to the Escalator in HMV Belfast. I think, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think yeah. that's a good one. So let me take you back then. Before HMV came along, Dave, let me take you back when you were a young boy. What do you remember about young and music and your first musical memories? Yeah, I was kind of. I was. Whenever you got in touch about doing this podcast, I had to kind of reach into the memory banks, mm. you know, get the old, get the old USBs out and ha- and have a think, because uh, it's so long ago, you know. Now I'm in my forties, <laughs> so it feels like, oh my god, it feels like it's so long ago. Didn't really grow up in a musical household, but I'm a I'm a twin, so my brother and I, who you know went on to play a lot of music together over the years, we were always interested in music and into it and kind of together we sort of discovered you know the bands that we liked and things like that and I think as as everybody does you know it's through your mates in school and through things like Top of the Pops and the radio back then you know there's I'm not going to go on a old man yells at Cloud kind of <laughs> approach here but it was so different you know you were kind of you were looking for the music you liked and then you would figure out okay well I, I think i think rock music is the sort of stuff i'm into i think and then you're trying to find those niche areas where you might hear that you know rock shows on radio one and, and things like that so yeah so lots of that and then you know through your pals in school there are always there are always these little different groups and cliques in school i'm sure you had the same yeah. at your school or some people are into some stuff and others are into others and that's you know you sort of you find your your mates that way so yeah through that i discovered lots of lots of new bands and things as well and for me it was when i was young i was all about nirvana and kind of i got huge into nirvana loved them loved a load of the grunge stuff um and and then started to get more interested in metal and the heavier side of things and and yeah it's kind of just expanded from then and it was through people in school that i that i joined my first band and it's all just you know up downhill from there uphill from there <laughs> what's the right way to use that phrase i feel like uphill from there implies a struggle but success yeah. Whereas downhill implies <laughs> that it's not going well, but actually it's easier. So anyway, it moved forward. It moved from forward. There. What, were your what, fir- what were your first records in, Dave? I can't imagine Nirvana was your first record. What were your first records? No, yeah, yeah, fair point. No, it wasn't that cool <laughs> at yeah. that point. I mean, the first, so the first physical media I can remember buying, I can remember asking my mum, God rest her, to get me a copy of the Amy Grant single Every Heartbeat which was probably like 1995 or something I think I just liked her hair I'm yeah. not really sure but a bit of a good chorus and then it was then uh, what well, like you know when you're a kid you listen to the weirdest stuff you know and you kind of you, you hear you don't really understand the connection to music it's mm. just something about how it makes you feel you know so you can hear a track on the radio and you're not thinking oh I don't I'm not into pop music you know or I, I'm more of a rock kid you don't think that way when you're very young you know so i remember being you know enjoying a lot of Hugh Lewis in the news uh when i was young when people would have thought what why is this eight-year-old love that song and then i remember buying a kiss single at one point and that kind of changed things but actually i think it was my brother herb who bought the kiss single to give him credit where credit's due and to be honest he was always ahead of the curve musically and still is uh, and he's, you know, he just has this way of finding great new music and turning me onto it. So really, I've got him to thank more than anybody. So yeah, eventually I guess find my way to to Nirvana. And again, that was probably through the likes of charts and chart shows and things like that. And just luck of the draw that that stuff became popular when it did, because otherwise, you know, we could be sitting here talking about God knows what. Mm-hmm. I could, I mean, as somebody who grew up in Belfast, you know, there's. We could be sitting here talking about some sort of weird religious kind of music that sort of, you know, really dated and ends up on like, I'm trying to think, what's the name of the guy that used to host Songs of Praise? I want to say Harry Seacom? Something like that. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Along that, that kind lines. of territory. Along those lines. So what, um, yeah. what made you want to pick up a guitar then, Dave? Was it the effect of Nirvana or were you kind of picking up a guitar before then? Uh, no, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was a, a kind of... It was obviously that combination of like the how the music makes you feel when you listen to it, and what you you know what you imagine when you listen to it. You know what you think your life could be like when you listen to music like that, because it impacts you on that sort of level. You know, it takes you outside of yourself. And then I think the combination of that, and then seeing bands perform on TV, and you sort of go, "What? What is this? Like, I don't, I don't even understand. I don't understand it." 
but I know it makes me feel amazing, <laughs> you know? And I think, uh, like, I can remember seeing people perform, and I remember at one point there was, like, there was a performance in school as well. Some band had come in for, for an event, and it was just like, oh, my God, this is, like, a, a live band? Okay. Like, they're doing it, you know? And just as soon as I saw that, I was just, I had to, I had to do it. So, yeah, got a guitar, well, my dad got myself and my brother a guitar and kind of figured it out from there. Still learning, Steve. I'll 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 figure out all twelve notes at some point. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still I'm still learning. You but yeah, uh, that was it really. You mentioned obviously you got a twin brother, Herb, and he was in Lafaro with you. Was the plan always to be in a band with your twin brother, or was that kind of the way, just the wires crossed and just the the road of destiny? Yeah, I think I think. We never talked about it, you know, just sort of, it's probably it was a bit, it was a given mm. that it would happen at some point. But I mean, the, the first band I was in, which was called, initially called Fuel, and then we had to change your name because Americans had the same name. <laughs> so we were called the much more snappy File Under Easy Listening, which is kind of a, an acronym of it or an expanded acronym, I guess. That band, Herb wasn't in that band initially, but he was always about with us, you know, and 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 again a crucial part of like that experience you know and then eventually herb joined that band on keys and then he was off doing his own thing you know and herb played bass in fighting with wire which is uh you've had cara on, yeah, the, on the podcast i love well. that band such uh, a great band oh amazing band mm. amazing band i remember the first time seeing Herb play bass for them and i was just i i don't know i was just like goosebumps mm. over this a combination of pride and also just like this band are serious you know so yeah, uh, yeah, kind of always. I, I suppose it was always a given that at some point Herb and I would end up in a band together, and probably amazing that it hasn't happened more <laughs> since since the demise of Lafaro. But but here we are, you know. Never say never, you know. It'll happen again at some point. That's great to hear. So I guess let's talk about Lafaro then, because it's probably where I first kind of heard of you. And we've had Rick from Ash on the podcast, who's mentioned Lafaro. Like mm. you've mentioned, we had Kahir and he mentioned the Faro is just missing out on his fantasy festival lineup. So the Faro almost uh. made his lineup. So t- I mean, the first time I had the Faro, I was kind of talking with Rick and we were kind of recommending music to one another, and he was like, "Give the Faro a listen. I think you'll like it." And I pressed play on the debut album, and my like, head almost exploded. It was just like this great guitar sound and angry vocal. It's right on my street. I loved it. So it's kind of that's about. How the Faro came about on that story because there's only two albums, right? Yeah, yeah, there. Uh, yeah, we managed to, <laughs> we managed to get two albums, out, uh, which in itself is a miracle. Yeah, I mean, the Faro, the Faro had existed before I was in the band, and like I was aware of them when I was in in a, a I was in a band called uh, the Debonairs before I was in the Faro, and I think when I was in Debonairs, the Faro were were gigging and playing, and I knew. Johnny and Alan from the Faro from college. We went to college together. So I'd seen them perform a bit. And I think I could be wrong here, but I have a feeling Herb and I DJed at one of the Faro's first gigs. They did a show. And I remember just this for a three piece, there was so much power, you know? Anyway, eventually one thing led to another. Debonair's kind of fizzles out. And the Faro were looking for a new bass player. And Johnny met me about it and asked me, you know, would I be interested in it? And I was kind of like, why are you asking me when like Herb's the bass player, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm straight away, I'm sort of thinking, has he got has he got us confused? We're yeah. twins, is he has he fucked up here? <laughs> um, but but actually, it, yeah, I think it was just you know, I think it assumed that Herb was you know going to be busy with fighting with Wire and things like that. Anyway, one thing led to another. Herb ended up not in fighting with Wire anymore, and then I said to Johnny, "Well, look, why don't we take both of us on? I'll play second guitar, get Herb on bass. Let's give that a go." And he was up for it, and yeah, and we we went for it, and it was kind of the first. It felt like the first professional kind of roll of the dice mm. uh, f- for me, and a great experience. Looking back on it now, but like it was at times, it was a real slog, you know, and a very hard kind of uh, band to be in. There was very little money, and we were kind of really we were trying to make things work, and but really really proud of the work we did and a lot of that first album was kind of already written mm. whenever herb and i joined the band so johnny had written a lot of that so we i think maybe there's you know it's like three tracks on that first album that we kind of put together as a band and then it was the second album which was much more 
kind of a, a group effort, but still, you know, Johnny did the lion's share of the of the writing there, and I mean, have to give him as much credit as I can. Like an incredible musician and songwriter, and uh, one of the best guitar players I've ever played with. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to see Johnny doing doing music again. But the thing that I loved the most about Lafaro was just was playing the live shows, just as a live band. Yeah, there was there was nothing like it. There, I don't know. You can't, it's kind of hard to put into words, which makes your job a nightmare because this is a podcast. <laughs> and it's it's a words based communication system. <laughs> but uh, but I just the energy just between the four of us was incredible. I mean, Al who played drums in Lafaro, and he's he's had his own thing going on the last while called Exhalers, which is uh, it's kind of similar heavy stuff and he's just he's an incredible drummer um and just playing with him and and herb as the rhythm section it was just like i, I don't know you, you, we the four of us we literally felt like we could take on anybody you know you get that kind of bravado as a band you know it's you against the world and yeah we were so lucky to to do the things we did to kind of deter with fighting with wire a good lot and then from there to kind of go on and Signed a deal with Small Town America Records to get the get the albums together, and then we got an agent and did lots of touring around Europe and and the UK, and we did did Europe with with Helmet. We did a bunch of festivals out there as well. Did a load of festivals in the UK. Did a load of tours with Therapy, and we toured with Ash as well. I think it's like a rite of passage. Mm, yeah. Any band <laughs> from, from Northern Ireland has to tour with Therapy and has to tour with Ash. I had already ticked the box with the Snow Patrol thing earlier on, so uh, my earlier bands had, had always played with Snow Patrol as well, as, as Ash as well. But, um, but yes, yeah, so we did a lot of that. We went over to, to the States. We did South by Southwest and then did a, a few of our, our own shows around that too. And and the guys in Lafaro had, had done South by Southwest a few years prior to that, so they had a bit of a heads up on it. So, like, incredible experience, you know, mm-hmm. but all very, very DIY with the label there to support us and help with the release. And, and it's funny, you know, was, I mean, Lafaro sort of just fizzled out for one reason or another. And uh, and I, I always get people saying, oh, I'd love Lafaro to get back together. And, you know, I'd love to play those songs again as well. So, so yeah, never say never, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. very fond memories. Yeah, well, I guess yeah. you never know what the future holds, right? So you just never know what's yeah. around the corner. So I guess a lot of people are still holding out for that because I think that would be really big news if that, um, that happens. So I guess we'll see what happens with Lafaro. But... Off to the Faro and then on to Little Matador. So you mentioned Nathan Connolly, who who I knew someone from Snow Patrol worked in HMV, but I didn't put the pieces together until you mentioned it. And I thought, oh, actually, that's where that started, right? Yeah. Um, well, terms actually, of the relationship. That that relationship had actually started prior to that. Um, right. and, and just to backtrack on your your HMV comment, it, it would it would only be fair to say that you're probably playing pretty fast and loose with the word worked there, Steve. Because <laughs> my memory, my memory of Nathan being, being an H- attended occasionally <laughs> would be the way to go. I'm sure I'm sure Rick's brother Dave would would attest to this. I just remember Nathan like dragging himself in at about two o'clock in the afternoon when he's right. meant to start at like nine, you know, in the in the stock room, and just it was like ah, oh. but he's such a charmer he get away with it. Anyway, Nathan's. Yeah, he's one of my, he's probably my oldest friend aside from Herb, you know, I mean, uh, we've known each other since we were, we were actually in primary school together, um, but weren't particularly close, um, like we knew each other, we hung out a little bit, but you know, it was only when we went to secondary school and and then eventually sort of, I don't know, sort of drew towards each other and, and Nathan was in a band and when I started playing guitar then they were looking for a second guitar player and then Nathan asked me and I think I was like 15 or something you know so uh, so yeah so we were in our our first band together when we were 15 and we did that for about five four or five years something like that maybe and at the time probably felt like it was 10 years but looking back it you know it's gone like it's gone in a flash. So that, that was uh, that was the band File Under Easy Listening. So it was it was Nathan, myself, and Aaron and Peter, who were who were two great friends of ours. And we, yeah, we kind of, you know, would rehearse in, in Pete's garage and make an absolute racket for the neighbours. And then, yeah, we'd, we'd gig a little bit. I mean, we were very young at that point. So our first gigs, and my first gig that I remember playing was in, was in a church in Bangor, which is just outside Belfast. And through those guys and Aaron and Nathan and Peter, they had a lot of friends in the, in the church as well. And they decided to put on this music festival. 
in this church in Bangor. And it was like, this is a, this was a big deal as well at the time. This is like 1997 in Belfast, you know, like Belfast was still, well, Northern Ireland was still mm. ropey back then. And yeah, this was like, what was it, I guess, five nights that they decided to do. So there'd be three or four bands on every day and they would ask all the local bands in the area and they'd fill the nights and it was each night was just packed with kids in this church hall completely packed so i remember the first gig i did was there and i was so nervous like i was terrified but it was just this church hall completely full with these rabid mental kids <laughs> same age as me going nuts and you felt like a superstar you know but that was the start of it and then we we kept writing together we got a, a development deal with a local label who were kind of connected to bmg and put out a single with them and then we sort of recorded some demos and tried to tried to make some stuff happen. And we were being managed at one point by, by Colin Murray, who is now the host of... I can't believe I'm going to say this. Who's now the host of Countdown. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, he was kind of working with that label and he was just like a man about town. And yeah, just was so great at giving us this kind of inspiration of, you know, giving us confidence and bringing us out of ourselves. So that, that was our first band, uh, Fuel. And when that came to an end, uh, after we'd done bits and pieces, Nathan then was was poached. Should we say poached? He was tapped up, to use the, the football yes. lingo. Yeah. He was tapped up by, uh, by Snow Patrol to play, I think it was left wing. And he uh-huh. accepted it. And as, as you would, moved to Glasgow, did their thing, you know, and you know, hard cut to 20 years later and I don't know how many million records sold, yeah. you know, and so proud of him and he's uh, he's come so far on a personal and musical level and still huge musical inspiration to me and, you know, we still talk all the time and he's always sent me tracks being like, oh, this is amazing, you would love this. So, we're like, we've always talked. So then whenever, I guess, the time came that Nathan decided you wanted to do something a bit different, yeah, that the little matador came along and that sort of, that ball got rolling we got um uh troy involved who was nathan's guitar tech at the time he's played with loads of acts like mm. um he was dandy warhols for a while you know he played with them and he's done a lot of stuff with uh, tired pony which is one of the other snow patrol projects so got troy in and then gavin fox and uh Benzer brennan who are renowned down here in dublin which is where i live now down in dublin they kind of uh, jumped on as the rhythm section so yeah we just got together in a room and we had we all had a few ideas and tried to make it happen and before we knew it we're over in metropolis studios in london for a few weeks just hashing a record out making that happen and yeah it was the, which was an intense process mm-hmm. as well because i hadn't done it that way before we sort of went in with a plan yeah we thought we went in with a plan <laughs> with, but we went in with some songs and we very quickly found out, well, actually, we might need to do a bit more work on these songs. So there was a lot of writing on the fly and stuff like that. But, but yeah, we got, got the record together. We're very, very fortunate through um, connections and contractual agreements that were already in place that we were able to release that on fiction records and get some good support behind it. So one thing led to another. And then we were, you know, we did some, did something like in once in a lifetime type gigs off the back of the little Matador project for me stuff that I'll I'll never forget and will always be incredibly grateful for you know playing with Queens of the Stone Age and in Belfast and Nine Inch Nails and you know doing tours with the likes of Jimmy World and stuff like that and then playing Sonosphere and other festivals that had always seemed just a little bit out of reach you know like the Faro had done Reading and Leeds and stuff like that but festivals are a strange business as as you're well aware, yeah, yeah. if anybody knows about it. Uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, one thing led to another. We, yeah, we just ended up kind of doing that for a while. And then, of course, as we all knew would happen, then, you know, the the Snow Patrol phone rings. It's a bit like in Batman when they have the red <laughs> red phone that rings for the mayor. You know, it's the, Nathan's phone rings, and it's, I assume it's Gary. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so he went off to do that for a bit. And so, yeah, it kind of, Little Matador took a back seat. Although Nathan did make a solo record mm. uh, then over the last few years. So it, that came out, I want to say, last year. Yeah, last year, out. yeah. Um, yeah, and, yeah and, and again, he, he gave me a call to get involved in that, which was an honour. So I kind of I co-wrote a bunch of songs on there and 
uh, played a lot on it and stuff as well. And we managed to get Simon from Biffy in on one of the tracks and uh, Alvaretti as well, who's an incredible artist from, from Dublin. Um, so, yeah, we got a good, good buzz going with that. But again, the Snow Patrol phone went off and now he's off, yeah, doing, doing the thing again. So they've got a new record coming out and it seems fantastic. You know, they've got a great buzz about them and they've had a lot of changes go on over the last the last year or so, but they seem to be flying and in great form. So best of health to them all, as always. Uh, just lovely, lovely boys. Yeah, they sound like a, a great set of lads. It's great that your friendship with Nathan has been tried and tested, I like, guess, through the years, but is as firm as what it's ever been. It's really nice to hear that his feet are down to earth and he's not just gone right. I'm in Snow Patrol now, so see you later. <laughs> he's kind of hung around. Yeah, basically. So, yeah, well, and look, if if that had ever happened, I'd be like, I totally understand. Of course, I would ditch a loser like me. As well. <laughs> uh, no, he's, he's one of my favourite people in the world, you know, one of my closest friends, and uh, he's always been so good to me as well. And yeah, can't say enough. Uh, enough about him um, but yeah overall I mean you know it's funny talking through this as well Steve because it's not like I, to be honest like I hate talking about myself even though for, for a job as a lecturer yeah. what I do now I'm a lecturer at BIM down in Dublin now for, for the most part most of it is you know talking about music but I I hate talking about myself I don't know what it is so this is kind of for me is like to put it all out there yeah. uh, is strange it makes me go oh Jesus it's actually been really great fun so, yeah, it would be important to acknowledge that, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to have been able to do the things I've been able to do. And I think anybody who gets into music and uh, commits to it, they'll, they'll find that, you know, that the, the good stuff should come your way if you take the right approach. It's just like, I mean, what a mad thing music is, you know, yeah. isn't it insane? Like, it's just, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Don't worry. But, <laughs> but it's, it's just incredible, you know. So, yeah, very, very grateful. Um, overall that's why I find this podcast fascinating right because it's whether you're an artist whether you're a fan whether you're a journalist I have all different types of people on this podcast everyone's got their own stories whether you've played on stage with Jimmy World or supported Queens of the Stone Age or whether you've been to a gig that made you feel like your heart was about to explode or but everyone's got that connection to it which is why I think this podcast is such an enjoyable one for me so you said you're a lecturer now but you still you still do play though right Dave your guitar days aren't over like you've played with Arvo Party or there's something with Arvo Party that I listened to and I thought yeah. this is a bit different from what the other stuff that I've heard <laughs> Definitely is, yeah. Um, yeah, the guitar days aren't aren't over yet. I haven't sold everything. Um, <laughs> I've just bought more stuff. Yeah, no, it's, I still play bits and pieces here and there, you know. And even with with Nathan's solo records, and you know, we did a we did a show last summer for that. And we'd hoped mm. to do a tour. We had booked a tour, but then we ended up having to pull it in the end for one reason or another. And uh, you know, I'd never. Um, turned on the opportunity to mm. to play in the right scenario, of course. The Arvo Party side of things is primarily actually Herb, uh, my brother from La Faro. Uh, I mean, he's not just from La Faro. Huh. Uh, it's Arvo Party is kind of is, is Herb's Herb's baby, and he's been doing that for a good few years now. Um, which is mostly a combination of kind of uh, um, ambient electronic stuff and more dance tinged. Um, electronic music as well as a lot of production stuff for other people you know so he's he's heavily involved in that and i mean talk about prolific i don't know how many albums he's put out under that name i mean it must be as well over 10 i should know wow. his brother no sorry i should know <laughs> but uh uh but in incredible stuff you know and he's been nominated for the northern ireland music prize a good bunch of times for it as well you know gets loads of radio play from it really incredible stuff to do on your own i wouldn't have the patience or commitment to be able to do that so it amazes me but occasionally he's asked me to put a guitar line on here and there you know feels bad for me so he'd be like oh, God, I suppose i should ask you to play some <laughs> guitar on this but that kind of stuff's right up my street you know because then i can just you know it's mostly about finding nice melodic guitar lines and and things like that and as a guitar player I mean, I love my riffs, you know, big bowl of riffs for breakfast every day, no problem. But uh, primarily it's it's melody that, that gets me, you know, so if there's a chance to put a nice little melodic guitar line in there or something tasty, I'll always uh, I'll always enjoy that. So, yeah, uh, I've, I've enjoyed putting the old bit and piece on the Arvo Party stuff. That's been great fun. More of that would be nice. Um, and I've kind of, over the last while, been working away on my own bits and pieces and hopefully we'll get something together over the next while. Yeah, because when I was listening to your playlist that we'll put in the episode description, there is a track 
which is credited to yourself, right? So it's an instrumental and it it's quite riffy. It's got a great little riff going on <laughs> in there. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one, actually, Steve. Yeah, that's um, that's an, an old friend of mine, Rhea O'Reilly. She's a she's a wrestler, uh, and I've known Rhea for uh, my two years. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't do her a disservice by say, but very kindly, she asked me as a wrestler. She was she'd been out injured for a while, and she uh, she was making this big return to the the promotion that she works with, and she asked me if I would write some entrance music for her, oh, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Would I? <laughs> um, so I've always had a soft spot for wrestling as well, and I think maybe that's where kind of the, you know, the musical impact mm. and the performance side of things. It's like you know, wrestling's a lot like kind of a, a rock show in yeah. a way. So yeah, so I, I yeah I put together a bunch of riffs, and yeah, she now uses that every time she walks down to the ring. That's kind of that's playing in the background, which is great, you know. And what a random thing to happen! Just so bizarre. <laughs> That's but uh, but I love it, yeah. And I would I would do a hundred of those. So if you're listening, wrestlers, I'll write your music, no problem. Oh, I got to love good, free. got to love good wrestling entrance music. <laughs> it's what it's all about. It's fantastic. So, on last week's podcast, I confessed to falling back in love with Bon Jovi. I had the pleasure of meeting John Bon Jovi <laughs> two weeks ago, and since then I've been back. I saw that as a fourteen year old, which was absolutely amazing. So I'm still still in my Bon Jovi phase. I can't lie to everyone who's listening to the podcast, but Dave. Whether it's new or old, what are you listening to at the moment, mate? What's what's on your speakers, whether it's streaming or it's physical? What are you listening to at the moment? Uh, well, it hasn't been Bon Jovi in a couple of weeks, <laughs> I have to say. But what am I listening to at the moment? Um, I keep going back to, and this will come up later as well, spoiler, but I keep going back to uh, this band Loathe um, and their their first record that came out a few years ago, which just totally caught me by surprise, this kind of shoegazy metal sort of vibe somewhere between i guess deft tones and more intense but also more melodic stuff very hard to explain but yeah i keep going back to that that loathe record i'm a big fan of that what else have i been listening to lately the uh the last amusement parks on fire record as well anarchia i love that record they're a great band again they have tons of melodies like these this wall of guitars but then they've got all these melodies buried in there so yeah, I've been listening to been listening to those. Last night, I went to see Smashing Pumpkins in Dublin. So been listening to I listened to them at five billion decibels last <laughs> night. Uh, my ears are still ringing, and uh, Weezer were the support. Yeah. Which I mean, somebody had told sixteen year old me, "Oh, you're going to see the Smashing Pumpkins with Weezer supporting them." <laughs> Talk about fantasy festival, yeah. you know? So that was great last night. Um, so yeah, listen to listen to a lot of that. You know how it is. You're getting geared up for going to a gig. You'll be like, oh, I'll throw on Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, and you know some of the Pumpkins records. Um, so yeah, yeah, listen to a lot of that. Some uh, I've been enjoying Men I Trust a lot lately. That uh, Uncle Jazz record from a few a few years ago is great. And and then there's just like I usually just have my liked songs playlist on oh. in the car, and it's it's just I mean it's. 400 of the same songs you know it's funny how like when you're young and you think like my dad right slight tangent here steve but my dad in the car he had like a three cd changer whenever we were you know driving yeah. to school and it, it, the three cds were as follows uh my first band single right just two songs <laughs> <laughs> neil diamond live hot august night banger and banger. then also paul simon's graceland i mean you know Two absolute classics, and then our single thrown in for fair play to him. Like, what a sweetheart. So, and I used to think when I was younger, how can you just listen to the same stuff over and over? Do you not go crazy? And it turns out I do exactly the same thing, <laughs> you know? but with a, with a Spotify playlist. So all the same stuff comes up on it. So it'll be like, there's lots of Bombay Bicycle Club. That uh, What's that record? Different kind of fix. I love that record. It's just gorgeous. Um Lots of Radiohead, lots of Mew. Have you ever heard Mew, Steve? Like I know Danish. of them from H and V, M E W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're one of those bands that like, pop up. You see the name and be like, I don't even know what that is. They're amazing. I love them. So yeah, it's all that sort of stuff. Always, always pops up, and and it's great. You know, like I, I again, I've been so lucky in my career so far because it's not over yet um, to play with a lot of bands that I love. So. It's a great reminder, you know, I'm listening to my playlist and I'm like, well, these are, you know, I'm like, I love these bands, but then you're sort of going, oh yeah, remember that time? 
that was great, you know. So, yeah, yeah, um, that's kind of what I'm listening to. Fantastic. Uh, but thanks to you, now I'll go and listen to more Bon Jovi because I did used to love Bon Jovi back uh, in the day. When I was 14, I had nothing else apart from on my cassette player all the time absolutely perfection so Dave this podcast is all about you collating your fantasy festival are you a big fan of the festival format have you been to many I guess you've probably played you mentioned you played like Reading and Sonisphere some great festivals you've played are you a big fan of the festivals um yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I guess no, I, I, I am but let's well let's say I was uh, and that's, that makes it sound like something terrible happened I don't have a story up my sleeve here at all but I think I just as I've gotten older the idea of it I'm like oh I don't know if I'd be able to cope with that you know at my age well, I'm only 42 or whatever don't even look I've lost count that's how old I am <laughs> can't count many years there have been but when I was younger loved them loved the vibe loved the buzz uh, you know getting to see a bunch of bands together all at the same time literally bands playing at the same time as each other and you can go and get a flavour of each amazing um, and particularly playing festivals always loved playing a festival it was always you know logistically <laughs> it's a bit of a a bit of a nightmare <laughs> potentially but um, but just incredible experience and yeah like you said very lucky to have played the likes of Sonosphere and you know big stages like that and then you get to stand at the side of the stage and watch like mm. you know heroes of yours like anthrax and stuff and just go what what am i do why am i here somebody should have there's been an administrative error a huge <laughs> administrative error um and then reading and leeds yeah played that a couple of times always enjoyed those and you're always getting to see great bands there mm. the festival i loved the most though was one that used to be I, i'm sure Cahar mentioned this there's no way he won't have mentioned this used to be a festival up in Draperstown in Northern Ireland called Glasgowbury. And it was all kind of Northern Irish and mostly Irish acts. The odd exception here or there. We get some some additional people in. But it was as much as anything testament to the strength of the scene at that time. You know, it was just powerful. So that was always my favourite festival. It was just such an experience because it's basically like getting in a field with all your mates. And then there's like 2,000 other people. You know, it's... Oh, just incredible. So the fire played that a lot, and we're very lucky to to be on that bill. Always really enjoyed it. It was a long, long day and a long night every year, but so enjoyable. So yeah, bring back Glasgowbury. That's that's the word I'd put out there. It would be my favourite one. I'd have to say. All right. Well, if you want to bring it back, you can do so because as you are my <laughs> guests, and for anyone who's not listening before, Dave gets to collate his fantasy festival. So Dave gets to pick. Any five acts, one of whom must play one of their studio albums in full and an encore, which all five acts will perform together to close his fantasy festival. So very simple, five acts take five time slots. So in the last episode, I had Kenny Harkis. He collated his Festival de la Santos lineup. He had Snow Goose as his opening act, which is a new act on me, but a great act nonetheless. In his super second, I let him have the long pigs and any RD. He put a good case forward for having both. I allowed it because I'm a nice guy. Midway Madness. We had Tears for Fears. The first time Tears for Fears have ever been picked for a fantasy festival lineup. That was a fantastic choice there. Pre headline, uh, we had Radiohead and Kenny picked them to play OK Computer in full. And for his headline act, he picked Paul Weller and then had all five back on stage to play Instant Karma to end his fantasy festival. So very simple for any first-time listeners. So, Dave, I'm looking forward to getting your line-up and going through it. But before we do, we need to give your fantasy festival a name, and we need to give it a venue. So to start off with, then, Dave, what are you going to call your fantasy festival? This has been so difficult, Steve. <laughs> I'm just putting... <laughs> Before I tell you the name and the location, just a warning to anybody else who's coming on the podcast in the future, you're going to think this is dead easy. Do you know what? It's not. Unless I'm, and my wife would make a case for this being so, the most indecisive man in Ireland. <laughs> um, honestly, it's so hard. Anyway, I, I thought of a few names. They were all terrible. So we're going to settle on the least terrible one. Um, I mentioned my unhidden love for uh for wrestling in there so we're gonna call it rocklemania <laughs> i love it i like what you've done there and dave it's a nod to wrestlemania but you know rocklemania so it's it's awful and i apologize but 
Here we are. Here we, we are. Do you know what? Yeah. My kids have got back. I used to love WWE when I was like 12, 13. I went to SummerSlam in 92. I was all over it. Lost touch with it. And then my girls recently, about two years ago through YouTube, got back into it. More the women's side, which was never a thing when I was watching wrestling. And since then, I've kind of embraced the entertainment element. So when you were talking about wrestling theme tunes, I was like, most of them are just cla- like rock riffs just to go round and round and just completely g up the crowd, right? Which are amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's all about that buzz. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it as kind of a lot of people watch Coronation Street or EastEnders or Hollyoaks. Or I could go on. But I guess wrestling is my Hollyoaks, except if you imagine, I don't know, Doc Cotton walks out into the calf and there's a big <laughs> rock riff playing. I, I don't know. If that makes sense, that's, that's, that's what I get from it. But yeah. Dave, let me ask you, then, what's your favourite ever entrance music? So mine's probably Bret Hart, but he was my favourite wrestler. But that was a very guitar-driven entrance theme. What, what's yours, just to go completely off-piste on this podcast for a sec? As a, well, first of all, that's a great show, Steve. And Bret is the best of all time. The best there is, best there was, yeah. best there ever will be. But I would have to say, <laughs> I probably always fall on the Stone Cold Steve Austin's music. Uh. It just, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it's probably the way it has like that sound of glass shattering at the start yeah. of it. Reminds me of my youth being in pubs in Belfast and people dropping pints. That's probably <laughs> what it is. Should really be followed with a big ew after that noise because that's how it is in, in the north. See, I'd go with that. I'd go with that. That's Sorry a, for going off beast. No, that's a great shout. We could even do a, 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 a separate wrestling 90s edition podcast, fantastical version, I guess, after this. So, Dave, <laughs> Rockle Mania, you can take us anywhere. You can take us back to that church in Bangor where you've played many a time as a young lad. You can take us across the pond. Wherever you go, big, small, far away, not far away, we'll follow you. So, Dave, where are we holding Rockle Mania? Uh, well, I'm a creature of habit. So I am going to go with uh, the Limelight in Belfast, which is where I've seen uh, so many of my favourite gigs. And it's kind of like a, it was a second home for me when I was growing up, um, getting my getting my drinking wings uh, back <laughs> in the day. And it's kind of, it's like a complex, so it has three venues in one. One's a big, kind of you know, pretty big, 2000-ish capacity. Then there's a tiny sort of pub in the middle. And then there's a kind of a, what, about 500 capacity on the other side. So potentially, yeah, it might be spread across three rooms just to cause logistical chaos. <laughs> we can do that. All right, before we talk about the five, you've said it's been a tough choice, this, and I appreciate how difficult it is getting all your musical faves just down to five. Any acts you want to shout out who you love but just haven't made it into our Rockle Mania lineup? There's about 500 of them, to be honest. Once I started thinking about this, Steve, then I realised, oh, we're going to have to whittle it down, but there were so many that have missed out. Yeah, I mean, I already mentioned the likes of Mew. Then there's bands like bands that I've just always loved, Jesus Lizard and uh, and Helmet, you know, that kind of 90s uh, riffage. Two of the absolute best to ever come out of Northern Ireland as well, Therapy and Ash. Therapy and Ash have to be in that conversation for me there. I mean, the, I grew up listening to them, you know, so... Uh, and again, to come back to the gratitude, to be able to perform with them was like mm-hmm. a miracle to me because literally, you know, I learned guitar listening to those guys. So they're in the conversation, definitely. And then there are, you know, other bands. There's so many bands from the North that I love. Fight with Wire, I'd love to see Fight with Wire again. Then... Herb's Arvo Party, I mean, it wouldn't work with the bill that I've chosen, the kind of ambient works of Herb McGee, but um, but I remember the first gig he ever did, and I was at it, and it, the buzz was just incredible, totally different vibe, so to have that in there was difficult for me to to sort of tailor the lineup in a certain way. I think, again, being one of the most indecisive men in Ireland, <laughs> this would... This would have to be the first of ten festivals potentially. There's just there are so many acts. Exhalers would love to see Al's band do that kind of thing. Kate Bush, I mean, you know, these are dream acts. You know, Faith No More, Deftones, The Wild Hearts. You know, bands that I've just loved forever. But yeah, just kind of. And then ultimately, I know when we talk through the lineup, I'm gonna go, yeah, I fucked this up. (laughs) <laughs> all right we'll all see right. we'll see <laughs> all right i must confess when i have someone on the podcast and i know someone who's a mutual acquaintance i text them so i text rick last night and i said i got dave on the podcast tomorrow i said 
who's he picking? I was like, give me your predictions and I'll measure them up at the end see if you're right. And yeah. he was, and he came back and he said, he gave me one act who I'll reveal after you go through your five. He was like, mate, he was like, it's impossible to predict anyone's acts because you never know where they're going to take it. But he did give me a name that's in my head. I'll reveal that okay. after and we'll see if he was... I think he's in the ballpark. I guess we'll have to see if he's going to be um, correct in his choices. Uh, I would imagine he'd be he'd be bang on. A fairly psychic man, <laughs> Mr. McMurray. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. All right, yeah. let's find out then. All right, two o'clock, the Limelight Belfast. Lovely day, Rockomania sold out. Your opening act's about to take the stage, Dave. So who is going to be your opening act at Rockomania? Okay, so I, I, this was difficult, the opening, because... It was well, it's because we're where I started, obviously. So <laughs> I've settled with one, but you know, I'm not sure if they should have been on later. But I've gone with uh, the band I mentioned earlier, Loathe, who are I think it's based in Liverpool. I think um, I missed out on seeing them last year. They were in Dublin with a band called Spirit Box from uh, the United States of America, and yeah, Loathe have got their just bags of intensity. So. The idea of seeing Loathe in the limelight to me is just like, yeah, totally super exciting. So, so I'll go with Loathe for the openers. I did consider putting the Wild Hearts in that opening spot because, yeah, they kind of they've always had a, I've always had a soft spot for the Wild Hearts. Just an incredible band, and you know if I was in a position to to do a combined festival to be able to kind of get a band in front of people and, and make them go look at this band the wild hearts would be up there i think they've been so underappreciated for 30 years and under acknowledged so yeah that 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 was a tough one but i've gone with loathe and uh i'd encourage anybody who hasn't to listen to their first record hopefully there'll be a second record soon of similar intensity so we're starting the day with yeah loads of riffs and then we'll we'll, we'll see where it goes from there Dave, maybe I'm getting old. Maybe I'm just a nice guy. But what I'm going to do for you, Dave, right? Loathe are going to play from two till three. I'm going to give the Wild Hearts a secret set. It can be in the other two venues, right? Not going to be announced, though. So you've got to be quick to get to where they're playing. They're going to do three till half three. But they're going to do it somewhere, not announce it. I think we'll do that what to get guy. Ginger and the boys in there. All right, let's, let's, let's get that sorted. What a guy. Steve, you just jumped to the top of my Christmas list. <laughs> I suppose I've made it a bit easier for you by giving you three venues, essentially, to choose <laughs> yeah. from. So we'll go, we'll go Loath in the limelight. I'll put the Wild Hearts in the small bar in the middle, which right. used to be called Kitty Daly's. That was that was the spot. I don't know what it's called now. That, yeah, that's that's a mind-blowing one, Steve. Thank you. Right. Forever in your debt. Forever. <laughs> let's do that. Then. So we've got Loath and the Wild Hearts. Super seconds in, we'll follow at half past three. Two tough acts to follow, but who have you picked, Dave, to be your super seconds act? Well, it's a, it's a tricky one again. I can to say I'm going to say it's a tricky one about ten thousand times because it's so you know the word. Say it with me, tricky. Tricky, yeah. That I kind of was like, well, you've got to you've got to go bucket list a bit with this. You really do. And I've gone with my bloody Valentine in that super seconds because. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever get a chance to see them. Um, and I just, I love the idea of completely <laughs> tearing the building down. I don't I don't want anything to happen to the limelight. For insurance purposes, I should be careful. <laughs> but but uh, the idea of them just absolutely, yeah, destroying the place sonically would be incredible. And I think, I might have to make this decision on the fly, but I think... My super seconds would also be the band that'll play an album in full. I think I'd have my bloody Valentine play Loveless from start to finish, shake the foundations, and yeah, create some sort of Belfast's first earthquake <laughs> all the way, all the way up Bedford Street. See what happens. All right, great shout. All right, my bloody Valentine, third time they've been picked. They're going to play Loveless in full. That is going to shake Belfast to its foundations, but in the best possible way all right so they're going to play from half three to half four it's like a half hour break then it'll be time for midway madness so two acts down three left to go dave who's going to be your midway madness act all right so midway madness i've gone for this is probably i would hedge a bet that this is the one that that rick suggested i would go for but i've gone for queens of the stone age for five to six uh and that midway madness slot and i was contemplating suggesting that they play the album songs for the deaf yeah. from start to finish but they've got so many other bangers that you can't restrict them so 
So yeah, Queens of the Stone Age and that Midway Madness lot, just one of the best bands of the last 25 years. All controversy aside, let's not delve into that. But as a band, just, you know, incredible, just incredible. Um, so yeah, I think that would be that would be insane. I can't imagine the idea of 30 minutes between having just seen My Bloody Valentine. You've probably got enough time to, you know, go outside, get a bit of fresh air, get a drink, and then Queens of the Stone Age are starting next door. What kind of existence would that even be? <laughs> uh, I mean, incredible. Yeah. So yeah, Queens of Stone Age, five to six, an hour of power. Just yeah. grateful. That is Midway Madness to the max. All right, Queens of the Stone Age, Midway Madness, fourth time they've been picked in the Fantastical podcast. It's going to be a great set. Only an hour, but it's going to be an hour to remember. We'll take a half hour break, so that'll leave two acts. So next up, you've got the pre-headline act, Dave. They're going to play from half six to eight o'clock. Who's going to be your pre-headliners? Good question. Uh, can I ask you a question in relation to this, Steve? Yeah, of course you can. How are you fixed on the idea of uh, bringing people back from the dead for this lineup? We can bring people back from That's not a problem. It's the whole fantasy element, so ah. we can bring people back from the dead. There's no problem in that. Amazing. In that case, then, my pre-headline act would be Mozart. No, sorry. The <laughs> pre-headline act would have to be Nirvana. It just has to be. I never got to see them. Um, I know people that did. I never got to see them live. They were such an influence on me as a musician and as a, a young person. Um, when, I, when I was a young person, they're still an influence on me as an old person. Uh, just one of the most intense um, live bands around you know all that power coming from Dave Grohl at the back I would love this to be Nirvana kind of on top of their game I think I think I would I was thinking about this last night would I go for the in utero lineup with Pat Smear okay. in there makes a lot of sense but I think I'd kind of go for the three piece lineup I think I just want the raw intensity it could be potentially a nightmare for the dressing room you know with uh, the rider obviously you're going to need certain things probably <laughs> supplied there which might be illegal but that's probably going to be the case across the board here so um i'm willing to take that yeah it ha i think it has to be it has to be nirvana you know like just talk about incendiary mm. live band and talk about an influential act yeah that would be incredible great i'd even yeah. put them i'd even put them in the big room just <laughs> just to be nice it must have had quite an impact, right, in Northern Ireland, because I'm I know Rick didn't pick them, but he spoke about them, and then Kahir spoke about being at the gig back, which changed everything for him, and he had Nirvana as his headliners, so it's quite evident, I think, how big Nirvana were, like in well, they were big all over the world, obviously, but the impact they had in Northern Ireland as well. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a really good point about the impact of Nirvana and grunge in general in Northern Ireland. I mm. think there was, I think it was a timing thing, mm. you know. You, the generations that kind of were coming up whenever Nirvana hit as a really big deal, these generations had, you know, been through some really rough stuff with the Troubles. So I think that idea of like rebellion and changing the status quo as far as popular culture went, which is what Nirvana did, they just threw it a complete curveball at the charts and at music and at what people wore and at how people spoke and like everything that I think I think people in, in Northern Ireland connected to that in a way because they were so disillusioned with life in the north they were looking for something different we we needed something to grab onto you know we, we weren't getting any inspiration from our politicians mm -hmm. or uh or anything around us you know and and it, it was that there was kind of gang mentality you know when you found your your people in the north because it was such an intense place in a lot of ways you know and uh, to find people on TV, who kind of had this us against the world thing, you know, they were, they were, you knew they were going through a hard time as musicians in a way, even though it was a totally different way. But you find a way that you could connect to their experience somehow. And it just kind of was like, yeah, I think, I think it's the kind of thing we'll probably look back on in another 20 years and, and realize that actually it had a bigger impact in, mm. uh, in for example, Northern Ireland, which is a tiny country. Than, than we might have acknowledged at the time. So, yeah, that's probably why loads of people love them in the north. Great stuff. All right, Nirvana, eighth time they've been picked for a fantasy festival. They're your pre-headline act. We're going to take one more half-hour break, and then it'll be our time for our last act. The headliners, 
who are going to headline Rockle Mania from half eight to 11 o'clock. Now, Dave, Rick's choice of act haven't been picked yet, so he's only got one act left for you to fulfil. So, Dave, who's going to headline Rockle Mania? Well, I, I don't think this is going to uh, take Rick's box, as it were. <laughs> That's There's a new phrase for you. Um, <laughs> I've got a bit of a curveball here as well. And again, you'll have to get the um, the world's best doctors on call because <laughs> there's some resurrection happening here. For the headline act, I've gone again with an act that I never got to see live and wished I had. My wife got to see this person live. Oh. And, you know, that's I'm fine with that. That's okay. I've gone for David Bowie with a bit of a caveat. Okay. Because they're there anyway... I want David Bowie with Queens of the Stone Age as the backing band. Oh, Bowie wow. was renowned for changing the band around, right? You know, we always had different bunch of musicians. And I know, you know, Iggy Pop did that kind of uh, American Valhalla thing with, with Josh Homme and kind of some of the lads from Queens yeah. as a as a backing band. Iggy and Bowie were always very tight back in the day. I would love to see what kind of things they could come up with. I mean, Bowie with Queens as a backing band. That's just you know, sick. I'm almost I'm almost gonna be I'm not gonna vomit on myself. <laughs> <in front of. laughs> so yeah, I'd I'd love to see that. You know, the different takes on songs and things like that would be incredible. Bowie was as an artist, I mean, there's no point in getting into it. You know, everybody knows what he was as an artist and how incredible and influential he was. For me, there's quite a specific sort of era of Bowie that I'm into. I'm not a fan of the early stuff, I'm not a fan of the Ziggy stuff. I'm strangely more drawn to like some of the, the 80s, 90s and onwards stuff that he did. I just feel like, I don't know why, I'm just managed to connect it to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, managed to connect to it in a different way and again i have herb to thank for that my my brother was a huge boy fan he kind of got me into him um and it's probably part of the reason why herb's such a great bass player as well because all those bass lines are killer bass lines on bowie tunes so so that's what i've gone for as the headline act i don't know if it would work it could be an absolute nightmare for boy to have queens of the stone age in the back of <laughs> he might he might hate them but sorry mr bowie sir You've, uh, you'll eat what you're given. So. <laughs> Amazing. It's David Bowie, he is the most picked person on this podcast. 19th time he's been picked. And at 11 o'clock after his set finishes, he's bringing back on stage Nirvana. Queens of the Stone Age already out. You've got My Bloody Valentine. The Wild Hearts are coming back out as our loaf. And they'll get to play one song. And they're all looking at you, Dave, going, get that guitar on, Dave. They're putting the guitar around your neck. You're coming back on stage as well. The fire are on the stage. Nathan's on the stage. Everyone's on the stage. Herb's on the stage. All get to play one song, Dave. What are you going to have your combined fantasy festival lineup play to close Rockle Mania? Well, as much as my um, financial brain suggests that I should choose a song that I've been involved in the writing of <laughs> to make these royalties here, you know, 10% of nothing is still nothing. So I'll go with... I'll go with uh, Heroes by Bowie. I mean, I can already hear that kind of Kevin Shields guitar stuff going on and create this huge cacophonous sound and, uh, you know, throw in everybody else that's involved there, you know, throw in Queens of Stone Age rhythm section, throw in uh, the intensity of, of Loathe's guitars, throw in some Cobain, you know, on top of that. I mean, Bowie probably wouldn't even have to sing a note. He'd <laughs> just stand there, Robbie Williams in the middle of Angels style, just hold the microphone out to the crowd, you know, have the time of his time of his death, time of his life. So I, I think that would be, yeah. And at that point, you know, if I've been involved in organising this, obviously knowing what the crack is, mm. as we say over here, with the stress of an event like that, at that final moment, that's the point where I can go, all right, I'm going to have a drink and relax. <laughs> I would, I would be standing at the side of the stage, crying my eyes out if that was if that was happening. You know that moment of heroes. You know, like at the end of a festival, you've had a really, you've had a long weekend. You're exhausted. Like I've worked loads of festivals. I've played loads of festivals. It's tiring, you know. So I think that kind of catharsis at the end for everybody is probably needed for the sake of our mental health as much as anything. So yeah, I think that would be glorious. Glorious. Amazing. Amazing. All right, Dave, let's lock that lineup in place in. So we've got Rock Mania taking place at the Limelight in Belfast. Open up, we're gonna have Loaf, but we're gonna have the Wild Hearts play in another room in the gap between them and your super seconds act, who are gonna be my bloody Valentine, who are gonna play Loveless and Fall. Midway Man has got Queens of the Stone Age. Pre headlining, we've got Nirvana. Headlining, we've got David Bowie, who's gonna be backed by Queens of the Stone Age. And for your encore, they're all going to play Heroes. Sounds amazing to me, Dave. You happy to talk that one into our fantastical vaults? Let's pop it in there. Five five quid a ticket. 
All right, what a bargain. Bargain price. Rick, by the way, <laughs> for we would be having an appearance by Slayer. Slayer were the ones who Rick said. I mean, he he would be wise to make that to make that call. <laughs> they they're definitely maybe next year, maybe next year, Rick, maybe maybe um, maybe Rockwell too. Maybe Rockwell Media too. Yeah, Slayer with uh, Rick McMurray on drums. That's <laughs> now we're talking. That would be class. That, that would be that. amazing. All right, I guess to before we wrap up, then you mentioned at the moment you're and you have been doing lecturing how did that come about and then how have you found out before we we kind of leave you on your way yeah the the lecturing thing is something i never ever thought i would do i when i moved on to to dublin to be with uh <laughs> i nearly did a poor out impression <laughs> did, nearly happened Always. to be with my my wife um <laughs> just doesn't sound right there when you say it in your own voice to, to be with my wife Eva. um I, you know, I was looking for work and I kind of went through some of the worst jobs known to man uh, when I was down here. I did the call centre stuff. I did, worked at a bar in Temple Bar, which is kind of, it's the, you know, it's the hub of, well, I was going to say it's the hub of drinking in Dublin, which it is, but therefore it's the hub of drinking in the world. <laughs> um, so I worked there for a while and it was just like, what is going on? I ended up, where, where else did I work? I worked in Build-A-Bear for a bit wow. yeah i worked in build a bear and then um one thing led to another and i saw bim were advertising for for lectures and i was i knew that uh gavin who had played bass in little matador with me he was uh doing bits and pieces there but i didn't really know much about them so i kind of did some research and and i applied to it and there you know the idea behind bim is that it's experienced musicians that are teaching the next generation in terms of the broad range of subjects that we cover from an academic standpoint. So uh, it wasn't just about being qualified. It wasn't just about being good at what you do. You've got to have the experience. So uh, yeah, one thing led to another and I ended up working there. I've been there eight years now. I love it. Um, It's amazing. The students blow my mind every time I'm in there with the way they approach things. Nothing makes me feel older than going to work. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, I, I really enjoy it as a job. Um, I've met loads of great people through it, loads of great students, and they're all going on to do incredible things. You know, we've had bands like um, The Murder Capital and Fontaine's yeah. DC that have come through us in the last few years. We've got tons more that are just constantly working on what they're doing, working on their craft, you know, and it's all down to them. They do the work. So, yeah. Very lucky to be working there, but definitely never thought I'd be a lecturer. Uh, <laughs> but here we are. Here, here we, we are. are. And I guess in terms, Dave, of kind of future in music, just an open road and see what comes up down the road? A little bit, yeah. I've had, yeah there have been some talks of getting back in a room with um, a couple of the guys from Lafaro, so we'll see if anything comes of that. There's always, you know, Nathan and myself are always mm. talking and saying, oh, we should do this, we should do that, we should do the other. So there, there will be something. It's just a matter of when. And I'm I'm up for for anything," um, <laughs> said said the guy, walking into the orgy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've been working on my own stuff, you know. For I, I, I'm not even gonna. I was half tempted there to say, you know, "I'm gonna release such and such." I can't commit to that. I've literally been working on bits and pieces for years at home, and whether it sees the light of day or not, who knows? But um, yeah, it'd be ni- it would be nice, I think, to put something on my own out as well. So so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Very much a watch this space. Right, Dave, if anyone wants to follow you or keep up to date with you, where can people find you on social media or any platforms that you want to push? Where's the best place to, to keep in touch with you to, to keep abreast of what you're doing? Um, yeah, for my sins, I'm on uh, Twitter a lot, formerly known as X. I think it's uh, at Dave Lafaro on there. I'm on Instagram as well, at Dave McGee with three E's at the end. Um, but I'm um, not really, I don't really like Instagram so much. Don't even talk to me about TikTok. But, but yeah, probably the easiest way to follow me is just come to my address, which is I'm not going to give out my address. No, I'm not going to say. Yeah, find me on Twitter and, yeah, send me great songs. That's all you got to do. Find Dave on Twitter, send him some great songs, and that is a beautiful way to end this fantastic podcast. So thanks to everyone for listening to the 168th episode of the Fantastical Podcast. If you've enjoyed this one like I have, and if you're a first-time listener, Please subscribe so you can subscribe via iTunes. You can also uh, follow us on iTunes and rate the podcast, which would be fantastic if you do. You can do the same on Spotify as well. You can follow the show. You can rate the show, which is really important as well. So thanks to 
ordinary people have done that this week. We've had quite a few in. And um, you can also comment on the episodes on Spotify as well. So don't be shy if you're listening that way. We are also on Twitter, as is Dave. So if you don't follow us on Twitter, please do so. You can find us at Fantastical P. I am on TikTok. I do one a week on a Sunday morning. I go out on a walk and I talk about the episode for a minute, which I actually quite enjoy. Um, and the kind of algorithms on TikTok are mental, the way it all works. I don't understand how that works. But I do enjoy talking on TikTok about the episode. So you can give us a follow on TikTok. And if you're not on Twitter or TikTok, you can email the pod at fantasticalpodcast at outlook.com. Unfortunately, we don't play music on the pod, but I'll get some tracks from Dave. We'll make a nice little playlist of the acts that he's spoken about in this podcast and chosen. So scroll down in the episode description and you'll find a nice little link there. So Dave, it's been an absolute wonder and a pleasure having you on the podcast. You've been my 168th guest. I've loved every second of it. How have you found it? <laughs> oh, it's been great. Thanks for having me, Steve. Just good to good to chat. Good to catch up with a fellow HMV here from back in the day. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Here's to the next 168 episodes. Absolutely. Here's to Rockomania 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yes, Rockomania! <laughs> Here's to it. What I, what I say, I'll commend you, though, because when you were talking about like not really talking about yourself, I thought you kind of spoke about yourself really well, and I think you've had some fascinating experiences, and you've done some amazing music so credit to you dave i look forward to seeing oh, thanks, what the future Steve. holds for you matey so next week i'm back with episode number 169 so please make sure to join me for that one but until then stay safe my fantastical friends please continue to spread the word and that word is fantastical thanks for listening <laughs>